Greetings, everyone. Welcome to City Lights Live. I'm Peter Maravellis, and tonight, City Lights, in conjunction with our friends at PEN America, present a program in honor of Band Book Week. It's part of a series of programs being staged across the country and which will run for the length of the week. As many of you know, Band Book Week has a special significance here at City Lights as the history of the freedom of expression is deeply interwoven with that of our own. The Howell trial of the late 50s was a pivotal moment in both the development of City Lights and that of this freedom of speech movement. The publication of Allen Ginsberg's Howell by City Lights, the subsequent persecution and court case, and then the ability for City Lights to prevail in a court of law opened up the way for publishers like Grove Press via Barney Rossett, New Directions via James Laughlin, to bring into print books that had been previously censored and unavailable to the public. Now, it's important to realize for a moment that there were really a lot of possibilities. Our founder, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, could have gone to jail for an extended period of time. He could have lost all of his assets, and the store could have been forced out of business. And if it wasn't for the good graces of City Lights attorneys Al Bendick and Jake Ehrlich of the ACLU, the outcome may have been very different for us. In fact, the Howell trial was not the only time City Lights went to court over books. There were two additional trials that extended into the late 60s involving the publication of a book by Lenore Kendall, and of all things, an issue of Zap Comics. So City Lights is no stranger to being at the epicenter of the battle for free expression. We published a book about the Hell Trial, which is a very nifty little edition. If you'd like to learn more about that, I will be posting links in the chat with which you can check it out. Uh, the court transcripts are in there and uh, lots of photographs, lots of goodies, so check it out. I'll be posting links. And uh, before we begin, I'd like to express our respect to those who came before us as stewards of the land, we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral grounds of the Ramatusha Ohlone peoples, also known as the San Francisco Bay Area. As is customary at the start of all of our events, I'd like to take this moment to stand in acknowledgement. So it's a pleasure to be working once again with Penn USA. We are celebrating actually their 100th anniversary this year. They continue to engage in important work, getting the word out, educating people about the precarious state of free expression in the US. We are once again at a crossroads. The banning and more recently the burning of books holds dire consequences for democracy. It becomes ever important for us to understand the scope of the threat and to mobilize to meet its challenge. So tonight's event is titled From Howl to Now, Book Bans in the US, City Lights and Penn bring together Bay Area authors in solidarity with authors across the country, coming together to discuss the alarming rise in book bans and the threat to freedom of expression. Our participants this evening have all felt the sting of censorship. They will share insights, observations, and methods to counter the suppression of books. Uh, tonight's program is a powerful call to action to stand up for the freedom to read. With us tonight is Ibik Burnett as moderator. She'll be joined by Marcus Ewart and Justin Hall, as well as Dashka Slater. Ibik Burnett is the author of the book, A Jungian Inquiry into the American Psyche, and the editor of the upcoming volume, Revisioning the American Psyche. She is a contributing editor, a, re a writer at uh, Counterpunch, as well as a Turkish novelist. She serves as the co-chair of Human Rights Watch Executive Committee in San Francisco. Joining her tonight is Marcus Ewart. Marcus is a Lambda Award-winning writer, actor, and director living in San Francisco. His work has appeared in numerous anthologies and publications, including Shampoo, Suspect Thoughts, Starline, and For Immediate Release. He is the author of the award-winning book, 10,000 Dresses, illustrated by Rex Ray and published by Seven Stories Press. Also joining us tonight is Justin Hall. He is an award-winning cartoonist and educator. He's created the comics True Travel Tra Tales, Hard to Swallow, and Theater of Terror, Revenge of the Queers. He has work in publication. He has um, such publications as um, Best American Comics, Best Erotic Comics, and he's also appeared in the SF Weekly. He created the Lambda Award-winning and Eisner-nominated collection No Straight Lines, Four Decades of Queer Comics, and was the producer on the feature-length documentary of the same name, which debuted at the Tribeca Film Festival and won the Best Documentary Award at Outfest in 2021. Justin Hall is the chair of the MFA in Comics at California College of the Arts, the full first 
Fulbright scholar of comics and has written about comics for various academic publications. Uh, he's curated international exhibits around the world. And uh, last but not least, we have Dashka Slater joining us. Dashka is an award-winning journalist who writes for such publications as the New York Times Magazine and Mother Jones. She is the author of 11 books of fiction and nonfiction for children and adults. Her children's book include um, Escar Go, Dangerously Ever After, and The Antlered Ship. She's uh, received numerous honors for her work, including a 2018 Stonewall Book Award from the American Library Association and a Beatty Book Award from the California Library Association, amongst others. Now, we were going to be joined by Dr. Jewel Parker Rhodes. We're sad to say she was feeling under the weather, regretfully could not join us tonight. So we send our best and wish her a speedy recovery. I will turn it over now to Ipic Burnett to get things started. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for that excellent introduction and um, welcome everyone. Uh, we're holding this event during Banned Books, Banned Books Week, uh, which has been now observed for 40 years. And this year's theme is Books Unite Us. I think it's such an important reminder that Books Unite Us, especially now as thousands, thousands of books are being banned from classrooms and libraries across the nation for being so-called divisive, divisive because they address American history, because they address issues of race and racism, gender identity, sexuality. Whereas in reality, books do unite us through empathy, imagination, and knowledge, and it is censorship, which is in fact divisive. So we have an incredible lineup this evening. I wanna jump right in, and first I wanna invite Summer Lopez, Chief Program Officer of Free Expression from PEN America to set the groundwork for our discussion. Uh, PEN America has been releasing report after report, all in depth, comprehensive, eye-opening to say the least, reports about the alarming rise of book bans and legislative restrictions across the nation. So, and all of that can be found at the PEN America's website. I highly recommend it for those who are interested in learning more. And so, Summer, can you please tell us about the disturbing trends that are taking place, especially in the last two years? Yes, thank you, Ipik, and, and thank you to Peter and City Lights. I'm so delighted to be here this evening and as we mark this 40th anniversary of Banned Books Week. Um, for those who may not be as familiar with PEN America, we are an organization that stands at the intersection of literature and human rights to defend free expression in the US and around the globe. And for 100 years now, we have championed the freedom to write, recognizing the power of the word to transform the world. And I have to say that for me personally, it's a special thrill to be part of an event with City Lights, which is one of my favorite bookstores in the world. I have vivid memories of visiting as a child with my mom, who I think may be in the virtual room this evening, um, on visits to San Francisco from my LA suburb where I grew up and where independent bookstores were not really a thing. So it's a delight to be here. Um, and City Lights is, of course, a supremely appropriate venue for this conversation. The courage that City Lights Press and Lawrence Berlinghetti showed in the Howell case uh, is indeed a seminal moment in freedom of expression and freedom to write and the freedom to read in American history. And it's obvious from the mere title of this event that I don't have to remind everybody that book bans are nothing new in this country and that they have never gone away completely. PEN America has been fighting back against them for decades, speaking out to ensure that books like The Bluest Eye, Handmaid's Tale, Slaughterhouse-Five, To Kill a Mockingbird remain in classrooms and on library shelves. But typically we deal with a few cases of book bans a year and at no point in recent memory have we seen anything like what's happening right now. Today there is a growing and increasingly organized movement to ban books in classrooms and school libraries around the country. And over the past year we have seen books yanked off of shelves at an ever quickening pace. In the updated report we released on Monday, PEN America identified more than 2,500 instances of books being banned during the 2021 to 22 school year in 138 school districts across 38 states. Those bans affect 1,648 unique book titles and they involve the work of more than 1,500 authors, illustrators, and translators. And there's no question that it is a very particular set of books that are being targeted today. By and large, these are books by and about LGBTQ people and people of color and dealing with issues of race, gender, and sexuality or American history. 
41% of the books listed in our index of banned books explicitly address LGBTQ themes or have prominent characters who are LGBTQ+, 40% feature prominent characters of color, and 21% address issues of race and racism. But that book banning efforts should target queer stories and the stories of people of color is, of course, also nothing new. And the discriminatory trope of labeling any queer content as obscene also has a long and unfortunate history that includes the, the attack on Howl. But what's different now is that so many books representing those long silenced perspectives were actually on the shelves to begin with. So I think what we're seeing today takes the form of a clear backlash against efforts to bring a more diverse and inclusive set of voices and perspectives into the classroom and the library. And in many cases, the groups pushing for bans are even just repurposing lists of diverse children's books as lists they encourage parents to challenge on the grounds that such books are dangerous. This means that while book bans are harmful to all children's rights to access and read a diverse range of books, the current wave of censorship is especially harmful for children who would see themselves in the stories that are being banned. Indeed, many of the authors of the books being targeted have said they wrote them in part because they didn't see themselves in any of the books they read when they were young. And also distinctive about this moment is that more often than not, the current challenges to books originate not from concerned parents acting individually, but from political and advocacy groups working to push for these restrictions. We've identified at least 50 groups pushing for book bans nationally and locally, including through hundreds of local chapters. The vast majority of these groups have formed just since 2021 as this movement has gained steam. And by our analysis, they've played a role in at least half of the book bans enacted across the country during the last school year. And we've also increasingly seen politicians stepping in to challenge books themselves. We believe that at least 40% of the bans we documented are connected to instances of political pressure or legislation designed to restrict teaching and learning. Because as mentioned earlier, this isn't just about book bans. Legislation has also been introduced across the country to restrict what can be discussed and taught in classrooms, what PEN America has called educational gag orders, and which also typically target discussions of race, gender, and American history. We've been tracking these two, and we've counted 137 such bills introduced in 2022. That's a 250% increase from 2021, which is essentially the first year that these really started happening. And lest we think the Howell case is a thing of the past, we've also seen at least 15 documented cases of criminal charges being filed or complaints filled out regarding distribution of obscenity or pornographic material in public and school libraries during the past school year. And in Virginia earlier this year, we saw an attempt to put two books on trial for obscenity, once again, in an effort to prevent bookstores from carrying them. Gender Queer, the most frequently banned book on our index, and A Court of Mist and Fury. Thankfully, that attempt failed. The judge dismissed the case, but it's possible it won't be the last such attempt. And the potential harm done by removing students' access to diverse stories is grave. By stripping these narratives from school shelves, book ban advocates are limiting the very learning opportunities that flourish in public schools and are undermining free expression. And we can't underestimate the importance for a young person of seeing themselves reflected in a book, of knowing that they are not alone in their experiences and emotions. It can be life-changing, even life-saving. And children who might encounter a story that is different than their own risk losing out on the opportunity to develop empathy and understanding. So book banning is an attack on the freedom to read, to write, and to think, and on the power of stories and literature, all of which is precisely what PEN America was founded to defend. Because the book banners do get one thing right. Books and stories are dangerous. They are dangerous to those who would prefer we not learn to think critically, to question the status quo, to imagine different futures. That's why book bans are a tool we see used by, by authoritarians around the world and why it's so essential to push back against them and defend uh, them as a threat as a defend against them as a threat to democracy. So I'm so glad everyone's here tonight and I'm really excited for this conversation. Um, and I hope you know that beyond this event, people will also make their voices heard on this issue. Um, it's the vast majority of Americans oppose book bans. We are seeing this pushed forward by a small but vocal minority. And if folks need to speak out and make their voices heard as well, you can do it on social media, in your own communities. You can read banned books. And of course, you can also join PEN America in our fight uh, to defend the freedom to write and the freedom to read. You can visit us at, at pen.org slash free the book to see our campaign information and take action and, and read our reports. Thank you so much for having me. Summer, thank you so much. That was incredibly helpful. 
the numbers you share are staggering and the statistics are so insightful and thank you for once again highlighting how well organized um strategic and politically motivated the this movement is uh i there's this one quote i really would like to share by ellen ginsburg who wrote I reject the insolence of self-righteous moralistic fundraising politicians or politically ambitious priests in using my poetry as a political football for their quasi-religious agendas. I have my own agenda for emotional and intellectual and political liberty in the US. I love that. And with that idea of emotional, intellectual, political liberation, I want to turn to our authors. I also want to acknowledge that sadly, Dr. Jewel Parker Rhodes could not be here with us today. I was really looking forward to talking to her about, she has multiple books that are being challenged and banned. I was really looking forward to talking to her about Ghost Boys, which is the story of a Black boy killed by a police officer, a familiar, unfortunately familiar story we know. And uh, Dr. Rhodes said writing that book was the hardest thing she's ever done in her life. And now it's been from classrooms in multiple states and under, under investigation and others. What she does so powerfully in that book is to really uplift empathy. Really, that is the heart of the story when she's talking about tackling these very complex issues of violence and justice and racism. Um, so we miss Dr. Rhodes. Another book though, that does that so beautifully in my opinion is The 57 Bus by Dashka Slater. So Dashka, it's such a pleasure to have you here. Um, I would like to invite you to conversation right now and let's first start uh, by talking about The 57 Bus, uh, how, that the story when how did you decide to write the story and it's for young adults though i must admit uh, as as a perfect perfect read for adults as well but why did you choose young adults as your audience and um did you anticipate any of these challenges as you were working on the book uh, thank you for uh those kind words about the 57 bus um so I, this was a story that i first covered for the new york times magazine and as I was working on it for the Times, I did have this kind of secret hope that I could write the same story in a different way for young adults. Um, I had already published at that point many books for kids. And I just felt that the issues were so compelling. This is the story of the 57 bus is a true story that happened in my neighborhood in Oakland um, in which uh, a young white agender person, 18 years old, was set on fire uh, on the 57 bus in Oakland um, while coming home from school. The kid who set the fire was 16, a young uh, black boy also from Oakland. Um, and the book follows both kids um, to sort of learn what brought them up to that moment where their paths crossed on the bus, what really happened on the bus, and then what happened with each of them afterwards. And so um, it's a story that um, explores a lot of issues that I felt like were really important and compelling for young people, both about gender identity, because Sasha, the person who was set on fire, um, identifies as, as gender queer, non-binary, and because um, the, the person who set the fire was a black kid who was swept into the criminal justice system and uh, was feeling all of the effects of uh, a, a system that relies on incarceration as the answer to every question. So issues of race, issues of justice, issues of gender, I felt like this is the stuff that kids should be and are already talking about, uh, that these are the compelling issues of our time to define you know, what we mean when we talk about gender. What do we mean when we talk about justice? How do we forge a path for ourselves in a system that has uh, so many scripts laid out, uh, particularly for marginalized people of different kinds? And so my delight when, this, when the book came out was that people were willing to engage in those questions and wanted to talk about them and that kids were reading it and that teachers wanted to teach it. 
and so on. And I had this lovely period of time where all my worst fears about the book being banned um, didn't come true. And in fact, all this great stuff happened and it was uh, used in schools across the country and internationally. Uh, and so then really quite recently, uh, things took a sudden turn and the book began to be challenged in state after state. Uh, sheriff's deputies were dispatched to um, investigate whether librarians should be arrested and criminally charged for having it on their shelves. Um, this was in uh, New Hanover, North Carolina. And so you know, all of these things that we're seeing suddenly became not just abstractions for me, but the story of my own work. Thank you, Dashka. And you know, one thing that I contacted you right after I read 57 bus and, and I wanted to talk to you about the challenges. And while we were talking, it became so clear to me that, well, first of all, you're very well informed about the book bans, not just what your the threats your book has received, how it's been targeted, but overall the field. And you you speak up, you stand up for the right to read, and uh, you are an activist, an author activist. So I'm curious about your journey to getting there, becoming an activist in this realm. Did this start with your own book being challenged or were you already aware of what was going on and um, some of your learnings that you picked up along the way? Well, of course, you know, I always think, well, when did I become an activist? Am I an activist? And these are kind of profound questions that I can't answer um, off the top of my head, but I have always believed in the power of the written word to affect change and the power of giving voice to people's stories. And so um, as I watched things happening with book bans, um, it happened to coincide with me writing a, another book about um, online extremism um, as it affected a group of high school students. Uh, that book, Accountable, will be out next year. And so I was watching this process of extremist forces and the work that they do um, online, in the real world, how they mobilize and how easy it is to not take them seriously. Because I think all of us have a little, you know, a sense of, uh, we are protected by our constitution. This is a democracy. None of these really terrible things, like it will be bad, but it won't be that bad. And um, I think, I hope that, people are beginning to understand after everything we have been through in the past five years, uh, that yes, it can be that bad. And you know, there is nothing that protects us from the consequences of extremism any more than they protect people across the globe. And so my activism on this is, is born out of a sense of terror because I am seeing, um, but all the different prongs of attack, that it's happening, happening legislatively, it's happening uh, through um, armed extremists like the Proud Boys showing up at libraries. Um, it is happening through online recruitment. Um, it is happening through book bans. It is happening at school bans, at, at school boards and at state legislatures. Um, it is happening in so many different ways. And we really are, um, in a battle for the soul of our country and to create, to control the narrative. That's what this is really about, is who gets to talk, who gets to tell their story, whose history is included. And there are absolutely uh, a small, but very well-funded and very well-organized group of people who would like to silence all the voices that have historically been pushed to the margins in this country. Uh, they are fine with that and they uh, would like to continue that. They are uh, Christian nationalists, many of them. They are authoritarians, many of them. And uh, I think our work here is to not only to organize, but also to educate so that I don't wanna scare people, but I do wanna scare people because I think we need to be scared. 
Ashka, thank you for everything you do to raise awareness. And thank you also for believing in the power of the word and books. Uh, I think that's so such an important reminder. Thanks also for introducing me to Marcus. So with that, I'm gonna invite Marcus to the conversation. Marcus, so wonderful to have you here. Uh, I wanna first talk to you about 10,000 Dresses. Um, such a beautiful book and correct me if I'm wrong, but when it got published in 2008, there weren't really books for young kids that tell the story of a transgender kid. Uh, yeah. So it was it was it was basically the first kids book um, with a um, an identifiable like a, a a trans character, let alone a main character. Uh, I'll just show this is the book Ten Thousand Dresses. And I just have to say the beautiful artwork was done by Rex Ray, who's no longer with us, and he used to be an in-house designer at City Lights Bookstore for a time period, and he did some beautiful, beautiful, beautiful book design for them in the 90s. So shout out to Rex Ray. Um, yeah, there was, there was really very little. Um, subsequently, a lot came. Now there's tons, there's tons of books. My day job is, I work at a, another independent bookstore here in San Francisco, and we specialize on LGBTQ books. And they're just hundreds, like the picture book scene, there's now, thankfully, a vast, vast number and coming from different, um, all sorts of different angles and different um, kind of degrees of, I don't know, like weightiness and some are more goofy and some are more, you know, it's, it's the nice thing that happens when, because there was a period of about a year or two where it was kind of just this and, you know, that's never a good, no one book should be like that. That should not be the trans book by, by any means. So um, I'm so glad that now there's many, many more books. Um, let's see, what do I, uh, what, what was the question again? <laughs> you, you already read my mind. I was going to ask you how it, I was going to ask you how it was received and what changed and you already uh, talked yeah. about what changed. How was it received in 2008? So um, interestingly enough, we got the attention of the American Library Association really early on. I'm not sure how that happened exactly, but almost right away, um, they seized on it. And I think they had been waiting for a book to talk about. A lot of librarians would tell me we've been waiting, you know, people have been asking us, are there any books, you know, that we can show kids? And at that time too, there were still very few uh, LGBTQ children's books, especially picture books, period, you know? Um, and friends with uh, Leslie and Newman who wrote Heather Has Two Mommies, which in the late 80s, mid 80s, late 80s, you know, that was really one of the first books. And it, I mean, the stories that she has to tell of like books being returned to the library, copies of her books being returned to the library with the pages glued together or with like literal shit on the pages or burnt or, I mean, she, she bore the brunt of a lot of stuff that we are all kind of thankful for. Um, so yeah, so for a while, the ALA was really great about it and some other groups. Um, and again, I think kind of just because there really wasn't anything, um, the book showed up on a lot of like curricular lists and um, recommendations and stuff. Um, I thought it was interesting what you said about that there's kind of this cut and paste mentality and that sometimes with books that are being challenged, it's not like people have read these books. They're just cut and paste, um, you know, this list. Oh, well, these must all be bad because look who's recommending them. And weirdly enough, that was actually happening to me a little bit on the left, which was very, very early on. The book is very, very clear that Jen, that Bailey, the main character, is a girl, but she's always and only referred to by female pronouns. And review after review after review would say, oh, it's about a boy who wants to wear dresses. It's about a boy who wants to wear dresses. What a great message. I was like, that is a great message. That's not, that's not careful reading of this book. Um, and 
So I think there is just a lot of, so the, even from people uh, championing the book, this, this narrative of like, it's about, a, you know, it's about boys can wear dresses if they want to. Um, and I kept saying, no, she's, it's, it's, that's not what the story is. It's a, it's a transgender girl. So I don't know. I think, I think things being read not super carefully can happen for all of us. I know that there are books that I have like heated opinions about that I haven't read, you know, but I'm like, oh, I, I know what that's all about. And I have to watch myself and be like, okay, you haven't actually seen that movie. You haven't actually watched that show, whatever. So um, what else do I want to say? Yeah, so I'm, I'm really I'm really honored that it um, got to go out into the world a lot. And recently it's, it's, it's kind of done well in a lot of the different Anglophone countries. So New Zealand, England, Ireland, Australia, um, from time to time. I think also because sometimes it's very expensive for books, like in Australia and New Zealand, it's very, very expensive for Amer to get American books. And so they're not getting all of the books that are available. And so I think mine, because it's been out for a while, uh, gets maybe the undue um, uh, kind of limelight. Um, recently, last year, uh, a press down in Brazil uh, uh, brought out a translation of the book and I was very happy and the, the woman, the editor, Fernanda, she was telling me that because of Bolsonaro and because of, you know, super right-wing repression there that, that she wanted to bring out a book. So I was, that was, I was very honored. Um, but yeah, I'm really glad though that I have to say, I'm really glad there are many, many more books than just mine. It's, it's, it, it's, it needs to be coming from so many different places. Also my book, all the, the people are all white and that's, it's, it's extraordinarily important, obviously that you have Native American uh, LGBTQ books. And there's a wonderful one called, interestingly enough, it has 10,000 in the title too. It's called 10,000 Beads. Pretty sure I'm getting the title right. Beautiful book about a two-spirit kid and um, also written by some local authors. Um, so I am very happy that there are so many books now um, from so many different, different people and perspectives. Uh, thank you, Marcus, for sharing that. And you've always, I watched the, presentation of yours from years ago but in it you said you always wanted to write children's books and yeah. and may I quote you from that presentation you said kids at a young age throw their whole being into the book their en entire engagement is in the book nowhere do you touch the whole being of a whole person as you do with a kid's book I find that so moving so mm -hmm. meaningful accurate and such a gift right the kids have these open eyes open hearts open minds this amazing curiosity and yet for some that is a threat um that doesn't feel safe and some conservative parents politicians wants want to obstruct the access um to those books that they as grown-ups uh deem to be confusing or dangerous and the movement is called parents rights uh, mm -hmm. to protect so-called protect the kids innocence your thoughts on as a children's book author your thoughts on this whole parents rights argument mm. i mean it's terrifying i think is the word that many of us have already used and i think it is the right word it's um i I don't know if this is going to come up later, but my I used to go out with Allen Ginsberg a million years ago when I was 17, 18. So through him, I heard about the Howell trials, right? I knew about this. And um, and when he would tell me about those time periods, I mean, it just sounded like the Scopes monkey trial, right? Or Scope monkey trial. You know, it just sounded like 
unbelievably backward and regressive and, and, oh, those funny people in the past, you know, and the fact that books, and I think to me, it's really terrifying the, the, the critical race theory books, because as, as has been said, that's American history. And that's terrifying to me that people want, it's like, you know, I can almost understand my books, but like, if, if you, I mean, because this is a made up story and da, 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 but like, if you're really talking about actual things that are on record that nobody can, I mean, it, it really becomes this weird Orwellian, like, how can you deny that this, you know, it's just gaslighting. I don't know if that's, if I said that super coherently, but um, no, it's, it's terrifying. It's really terrifying. Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't experienced stuff very close. There have been challenges to the book. Um, there was a father in, I want to say, uh, uh, Ohio, maybe Iowa, a couple years back, and he challenged it in his school system. And I know in Texas and stuff, I'm not, I haven't really been following the, the, uh, the, where it's been challenged. So for me personally, it's not, and I live here in the Bay Area in this very wonderful, queer, lit, alternative bubble. Um, I will say one other thing. Um, so my, I've been fortunate too that my books have been adopted by the whole drag queen story hour movement, which is a brilliant, wonderful thing. And there's a local drag queen named Panda Dulce and she was reading, she's, she's a fan of 10,000 Dresses and she was actually reading another one of my books that has nothing to do with gender or anything. And that was when the Proud Boys came in to the library. And I, I got to, Dashka actually had, Dashka actually really was a great job of publicizing what was going on for Panda. Um, and Dashka was able to show me some of the footage they had taken from inside of the library, and it's terrifying. I mean, these men are, the idea that, I mean, what, I can't even remember what the logos that they had, you know, on their thing about, like, shoot everybody, you know, it's, it's, so I think also it's interesting, or, or it's important to remember that there's, like, sort of legislature and procedural protesting but then there's I mean just sheer intimidation I mean these poor parents and kids you know and the 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 proud boy people were going like you know why are you letting this pedophile why are you letting this groomer teach your kids da, da, da. no one wanted to say anything I'm guessing because they were afraid they were going to get shot I mean it really felt like this could be you know and this was in a summer with lots of shootings um so there's just so many different ways of, there's so many different ways of dissuading and suppressing. And, um, and, and I think the most basic one that we've all kind of talked about is if the information isn't there at all, if you don't see yourself represented and that your story has not been told or has not been told accurately, it's been told by the oppressive in that situation, your ability to imagine things is 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 limited you know you really need to see you need to have words you need to have just the sheer words to to be able to generate right otherwise you have to do so much work i think just fighting the gaslighting and fighting the inferiority and whatever that you can't you have to just stay there answering that question over and over and over and you can't you can't really tell your own story and make new things and and yeah. You know, so I hope that I hope that was coherent. <laughs> uh, Marcus, the moral of the story, it's terrifying, right? Yeah. Terrifying. Yeah. It really yeah. is terrifying. Yeah. And and um since we're talking about the LGBTQ plus and summer shared some interesting trends. Back in the day in March when Pan America released its first report on banned in the USA. Most of the books that were banned, challenged at the time, were 
addressing issues of race and racism and legacy of slavery. And this report that came out that on, on Monday, six months later, now it is the majority, 41%, the majority of the books that are being challenged or banned are they either have the themes of LGBTQ a um, IA themes or protagonists or secondary or primary characters. And then when we look at the most banned book in the past year, if not two, it's genderqueer and which is a graphic novel. And with that, I'm going to invite Justin Hall, our expert on this, to talk to us um, because Justin, you are an academic, you are a educator, you teach history of um, queer comics to graduate students. Could you please tell us uh, a little bit about the very specific challenges, unique vulnerabilities of comic mm -hmm. books and graphic novels? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, thank and thank you for, for this whole discussion and bringing me, bringing me in here. Um, uh, Maya Kobabe, who created Gender Queer, uh, was actually one of my first students. Uh, in our MFA in comics, she, uh, 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 Maya was the in the inaugural uh, class, graduating class of the MFA in comics, and he did not produce uh, for a thesis work that was genderqueer, but he went on to uh, later on create genderqueer, and um, so proud of them for doing this, and it's just magnificent. It's a magnificent book, highly recommended. I think it's one of the most uh, profound and powerful descriptions of a non-binary identity that I've ever seen in any medium. Um, and, you know, it's on the one hand horrifying that it's gotten swept up in this uh, and all these, uh, you know, terrifying, this, to use your word, um, uh, you know, social um, advocacies and um, intimidations. However, on the, on the other hand, it's really reached a lot of people that needed to, to, to see themselves represented in the world. Um, and, you know, I think comics and uh, because com uh, Marcus had mentioned the the power of representation in the word that we have to sort of see ourselves represented back in some way um, through through words, and that's really important. But uh, visual images are also incredibly important, uh, and visual storytelling. So, you know, I think about uh, you know important cartoonists like Alison Bechdel with Dykes to Watch Out For. Uh, you know, generation a uh, whole generation I think of queer people first saw themselves on the page and and in these strips. Um, uh, fabulous, uh, mostly on fabulous social life of Ethan Green, Dykes to Watch Out For, these sort of strips that ran in the in the queer newspapers. Um, and then I, I think about Mary Wings, who was the first um, uh, the first cartoonist to create a lesbian comic book, uh, Come Out Comics, in 1972. And she was she's in the Bay Area. She's here in San Francisco. Uh, and uh, she said she she was 19 before she heard the word lesbian. She didn't know that that she that she, she she thought she was the only person in the world like this and she didn't know and so she wanted to make sure that no one else had to go through that ever again and so she created come out comics on a you know mimeograph machine in the basement of a radical women's karate cooperative <laughs> in in Oregon and uh, distributed her, uh, herself uh, for a dollar and um uh, later got picked up by Last Gas dist Distribution, which is a local San Francisco sort of legendary uh, underground comics producer and, and uh, publisher and distributor. Uh, and, you know, the feminist underground comics movement was born uh, really out of that in a lot of ways. Uh, so so there's, a, there's a profound legacy of comics um, uh, stepping up for this sort of representation. Um, I, I, I think there's three reasons. Uh, comics tend to have a sort of double, there tends to be a double standard around them in terms of censorship and um, uh, and sort of oppression. And I, I think for three reasons. One would be that they're associated with children, right? You, it's it's sort of inherent in the name that, that we use the word comics because they come out of the comic strips, the funny pages. Uh, and there's a sort of dismissive quality to that language, um, but we're sort of stuck with it, right? It's, it's also true, uh, the largest, comic book um, uh, industry in the world was in Japan. They use the, the term manga. Manga also means whimsical pictures or silly pictures, right? Uh, similarly to the movement to, to create a new uh, terminology with graphic novels and sequential art that happened in, in English, the same thing happened in Japanese. They came up with the, the word gakiga, means uh, dramatic pictures to try to move, you know, give some weight and some gravitas to, to the form. Um, I would say the the best uh, probably the best terminology for the for the form is the French, which is bande dessinée or BD, which which means illustrated strips. It's just description of form as opposed to content. But we're stuck with this sort of association of of all 
everything done in this form being for children. Um, and that, you know, so when uh, censorship battles happen in the, in the um, throughout the comics history, but very profoundly in the 1950s, we wound up with the Comics Code Authority in 1954. And it was really the most draconian form of censorship ever in American history for, for a, a particular kind of popular uh, medium, art, art form. And um, it was because they everything had to be super G-rated, right? Because they assumed the only people that could ever, ever would ever want to read comics would be children. Um, so that's that's the one thing. And then the other thing it would be that it's this, the sense of it being sort of degenerate literature and and not really literature at all and contributing to illiteracy. And so for a long time, you know, we talk about uh, librarians as being champions of 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 diverse reading material and sort of. In, in our corner, uh, they were not in the corner of comics for, uh, for a long, long time. Uh, I'm happy to say that it's turned around and now you know, librarians are my heroes. Um, but, but for a long time, they, there really was the sense that reading comics would lead to illiteracy. Um, and we know that's not true, uh, that you, know, you read comics oftentimes as a way to get closer to textual to text literacy, but it also has its own form of literacy, right? Where you can learn how to read visual storytelling uh, and you learn a whole another set of skills associated, associated with the form of comics. Um, and then the third reason is simply the, the graphic nature of it, the illustrative nature of it. So you can write about a sex scene, you can write about a body, uh, but if you dare to show it uh, visually, then that becomes a whole other issue. So, so you know, Maya's book is a good example. Um, uh, gender queer is constantly being attacked as being uh, uh, pornographic. And the reality it is not pornographic. Uh, I, would, I would define pornography as as where one of uh, um, a work in which one of the primary artistic intentions of the work is sexual titillation and and sexual arousal, that is clearly not happening. And, and gender queer is not about that at all. But it does dare to show bodies, to show naked bodies, um, and. Um, th there's simply you know a, the imagination, the sort of lack of imagination of that if you show you know, a naked body, a human body, a genitalia, that it, it automatically is pornographic. Uh, whereas you can sort of write about genitalia or human bodies uh, without triggering that automatic assumption. So it's something that, you know, comics face a unique set of challenges and it's it's no it's no accident that uh, comics went, and graphic novels wind up at the top of the banned book, banned book lists. Wow, Justin, you covered so much just now. Thank you so much. I, I'm, a, I'm a comics history nerd. I, 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 I go down the rabbit holes. So you got to stop me if I start to ramble down the rabbit holes. <laughs> no, that's wonderful. I'm, I'm actually really curious about your teaching too. And could you tell us a little bit about in class? What, what are some of the questions that your students raise when it comes to censorship? Um, what do they already know? Are, do they have any surprises or perhaps are any surprises for you as you work with your students? Yeah, uh, it's it's an interesting question. The, um, I, I think they're oftentimes surprised at the battles that happen earlier in, in comic mm -hmm. history, right? Because, you know, comic strips were one of the great uh, art forms and, you know, uh, American art forms, right? Uh, and there were times when, uh, you know, Crazy Cat or Little Nemo in Slumberland would take up a full page of the newspaper and uh, were, you know, drawn and uh, conceived and written by, you know, real genius level creators. Uh, and really pushed, you know, tremendous boundaries. Crazy Cat is sort of remains one of the great American, you know, I think creative productions ever. Um, and um, uh, and there, of course, there were there were political and cultural battles around this, right? There were uh, concerned parent groups and sort of uh, all, all, the, all the things that we see now happening back then. There was this sense that the the Sunday pages, the Sunday comics, the colored pages, were um, uh, causing juvenile delinquency because they were pulling children away from church. They were in competition with church, um, and uh, some of that got disrupted by World War One, and oh, both World Wars. But then it really came back in full force with the comic books, which are really magazines, serialized magazines, um, and uh, uh, you know, and it ultimately wound up uh, led us to the Comics Code Authority in 1954. But there were book burnings, all you know, a massive, massive amount of book burnings all across the United States, where, you know, during the, the, the 40s and early 50s, where, um, you know, churches and uh, schools and libraries would take out comics and throw them onto massive pyres and, and burn them. Um, so, you know, comics are not, are not, uh, uh, you know, are used to this sort of thing. On the, on the other hand, there's, you know, there's still sort of moments in which, 
really radical stuff got through. You know, if you if you read um, <clears throat> the 1940s Wonder Woman, for example, which I'm particularly obsessed with, so please stop me if I start going down this particular rabbit hole. Um, but it's uh, it's one of the most radical things pub ever published in America. I mean, it's got this incredibly kink positive feminism that uh, suffuses the whole work. And I think uh, the creators got away with it because no one knew what they were looking at. Um, and then of course you have the underground comics movement. Um, it was mentioned at the top of this program that, um, you know, City Likes uh, was embroiled in a legal battle over Zap Comics. Certainly the underground comics movement was, you know, faced a lot of uh, censorship challenges. Um, and, you know, now, you know, uh, the as soon as, of course, you start adding in, in the current uh, in, uh, political environment, you start adding issues of, of you know, uh, representation of race and um, ethnicity, and then also uh, queer, uh, queer identities, it, you know, you're going to run into uh, a multiplicity of these sort of challenges, right? So, and we're seeing that with genderqueer. Um, on the other hand, I would also just point out what something that Marcus said, that, that at the same time, we're, we're experiencing all these challenges. At the same time, there is a tremendous amount of material being produced now. Like it's, and it's absolutely overwhelming and incredibly inspiring. Um, you know, I started making comics in, in the early 2000s and there was very little. Um, and anything that was, uh, anything that was queer in comics was, you know, had to be sort of an underground publication and um, it was you know, not dealt with in the, in the mainstream. And now there's, you know, you have, a fun home on, as a national bestseller, and you've got um, you know a, a, a lesbian Batwoman, right? I mean, it's 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 we've come a long way, uh, and there's tremendous amount of material. So, my husband says I have a serotonin imbalance, and I'm too perpetually happy and optimistic. So please stop me if I. But um, but I do think a lot of this th these reactions are to the fact that you know the culture has changed and is changing, right? And representation is showing up in our libraries, in our schools, in, in on our television, uh, in our comic books, in our books, in our poetry. And there's, they can only, I don't think they can stop it ultimately. Um, but, you know, maybe, maybe, I'm, I, 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 maybe I'm just being naive and optimistic, but I, I you know, I think there is, um, as uh, Dashka said, there is a battle here going on, but, but I, I do believe that that these, you know, the, the better material will win. Justin, thank you for that, because sometimes we do need that. Well, not sometimes, these days a lot. We do need that voice of hope and inspiration, because I, like Dashka, do feel the dread and the doom, mostly. So, so I do appreciate your perspective. And um, to bring the doom and the dread back into the conversation, we um, talked about a little bit about intimidation and threats. And with that, I want to take a moment to address the recent attack, the stabbing of Salman Rushdie, who was the former president of PEN America. And Summer, I would love it if you could jump in and say a few words about Salman Rushdie's role in, in the PEN uh, America organization and community and the significance of the attack. And then I also would like to invite everyone to who feels moved to share their reflections, feelings, either about Salman Rushdie's attack or also feel free to add, have you ever received an attack, a threat, an intimidation, or one of your you know, fellow authors, uh, any, any experiences you would like to share with the audience? Thank you for that, Ipek. Um, it's you know it's been a, a really emotional um, month for us at Pen America since the attack on Salman, um, which came, you know, as a shock. Even though obviously we knew that the the fatwa had never gone away entirely, but of course after so long of of Salman living uh, very freely and and attending many pen events regularly. Um, you know, and being such a, a kind of fixture in the literary community here it certainly um, did indeed come as, as a, a very uh, shocking moment. Um, you know, the original, the fatwa itself was another kind of seminal moment um, in, in Pan America's history. Um, you know, it was something that really galvanized our community um, around, you know, a, a, such a tangible threat to the freedom to write. Um, made very stark for people, you know, the, the stakes and the ways in which books can be viewed as threats and the ways in which authoritarians go after them. Um, and, you know, I think, and Salman, uh, you know, since he kind of emerged from, from 
more of, of living more in hiding um, has has been such a stalwart, you know, defender of freedom of expression. He has been extremely activist on behalf of other writers under threat and in prison around the world um, uh, and deeply engaged in, in the defense of freedom of expression. And I think his, his courage and his activism, there are just few people whose lives sort of um, embody what PEN America is about and the fight for freedom of expression the way that he does. So, um, you know, we uh, we organized a very quickly a demonstration of solidarity with him on the steps of the New York Public Library a week after he was stabbed um, with a number of prominent writers reading his work to demonstrate that his words would not be silenced, we would not be silenced, um, and that, you know, that, that those attempts do indeed fail, um, you know, and so uh, I think that you know it's a very important moment. I think in the in connection with what we are seeing around the country to recognize again the sort of authoritarian impulse to silence and to determine what people can read and can't to decide what is blasphemous and what is obscene. Um, and I think, you know, we don't want to hand that power over to anybody. Um, we don't want to allow that, those restrictions to be enacted and that that can go down a very dangerous path. So um, it does make all of this kind of happening at the same time is definitely um, very stark and sends a very powerful message. Thank you, Summer. Um, anybody else who wants to jump in? I'll jump in, um, and I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble with my connection, so I, I hope I'm not breaking up too much. You are, you are um, breaking up a little, Dashka. I, as, as Marcus mentioned, I did some work this summer, so let's have someone else talk, and I'm going to try and work on my connection. Uh, I think we lost Dashka, but oh, she's back. She's I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. Okay. Welcome so back. Tell me if this is any better. Uh, if it is, I will talk and you'll stop me if it isn't. Okay. Uh, so I did spend some time this summer, as Marcus mentioned, um, trying to support Panda Dulce, who is the a uh, drag queen whose uh, story hour came under attack and uh, this summer by the Proud Boys um, who came to the library in San Lorenzo, which is uh, just two towns over from Oakland. Um, and there were half a dozen of them. They did, as Marcus mentioned, one of them had a t-shirt with an AK-47. They were saying things like, uh, you know, we kill pedophiles. Um, Panda had to take refuge. Um, in the back of the library, the Proud Boys were um, ushered out of the library by sheriff's deputies who did not make any arrests. And then uh, they immediately started roaming around the building uh, looking for Panda. So it was a very intimidating situation that I was not there when it happened, but I did spend um, a lot of time watching video of it and trying to get the word out. And so when the uh, attack on Salman Rushdie happened uh, later this summer, I had this feeling of, oh my God, this is, uh, this is where we're going. And um, I think uh, one of the things that's very upsetting about this moment is that uh, the threat of violence is always underneath. And you know whether or not it manifests, librarians all over this country are feeling under attack because they are dealing with angry patrons, um, angry parents, teachers as well. Um, this entire nation has gotten somewhat unhinged in it, the way that people behave um, in the public sphere anyway. And we are also very heavily armed as a country. And so, you put those things together and it is an atmosphere of intimidation. And that intimidation uh, is extremely effective in uh, getting to the point of self-censorship. 
and School Library Journal just um, uh, released a study this week showing that 97% of librarians are self-censoring, are deciding what books to put in their libraries uh, based on this question of, uh, is this going to be uh, an issue for me? And, you know, while, of course, we want everyone to be courageous and to fight this fight because we need every single soul involved, also uh, in a field that is, um, in, that is dominated by women, dominated by queer people as well, um, there is a, you know, a built-in vulnerability. It is also because as all gendered fields are underpaid. And so, um, you know, and this has been a really rough few years for people who work in education. Um, it is, librarians have been on the front lines um, in trying to sort of hold our civic society together and be a refuge. They have had to navigate the masking questions um, just as teachers have. And so all of these things put together when people are feeling stressed, underpaid, um, worried about uh, violence, worried about um, there being repercussions in their community and in their community relationships, uh, all of those things press down on people and make it easier to make the easier decisions, the non-controversial decisions. And, you know, just to uh, point out that the non-controversial decisions that has been defined for us. And so that, you know, the, the very existence of queer people and people of color has now become controversial, um, which I think we really need to push back against and, and, and to say that this sort of non-controversial default is a bogus default, you know, that, that wasn't an accurate or true representation of the lives of anybody. And so um, I, I think that the, the implications of having fear um, interjected into this conversation and from any source, um, it has this spreading and chilling effect. And even though I also, I do wanna say, have a lot of optimism because I do think that the you know every study shows every survey every poll that more people many more people want to have a variety of voices want to have open discussion want to hear uh, all of the stories that haven't been told are excited about queer comics and are excited uh, about true and accurate history um, and you know that that's actually what people want and the reason that people are so upset is because the generation that is being raised on these stories is amazing. And, uh, <laughs> and they are absolutely committed to creating a, a better, uh, more inclusive, more radical and more fun society. Ashka, thank you so much. Thank you for everything you said. And also thank you for talking about librarians because I really wanted to highlight them as well and the teachers who in these escalating culture wars have become frontline soldiers, like you said, as if they didn't have enough uh, on their plates from COVID to school shootings. Um, so we all have to do better supporting them. I, this is, I have so many questions and I wanna also make space for the, uh, from the audience to ask questions as well. But I, what can we do better in supporting librarians, teachers? And sometimes, honestly, it feels like we are playing catch up and defense, which is important. We need to defend. At the same time, how can we be better in terms of being proactive, protecting freedom of speech and uh, protecting libraries? protecting our rights, the freedom to read, uh, so we don't come, to, it's a slippery slope. Uh, as Margaret Atwood says, we can't take democracy for granted. We know things shift. Um, so any anyone wants to talk about that? Justin, I see a hand. <laughs> I, I, I did also, not to just <laughs> just complicate the question, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not, uh, and uh, not answering it, but just um, I'm wondering also about your everybody's thoughts about the digital realm. Right, because um, it's oftentimes 
used as a sort of way, well, you know, you, you can get away from, you know, needing to have the, the book on the shelf in the library because you can get it online. But um, I am also worried about how digital platforms are censoring books. Um, and um, so I'm wondering how you all just sort of reactions to that. I mean, I can say briefly, I mean, we definitely are seeing, you know, some online um, library systems also being targeted. And so, you know, I think I completely agree. That's not a reason to not be concerned about the physical copies. Also, of course, there are questions of access and who actually has access to those. We also saw one case where a teacher was, um, I'm trying to remember, um, Taslin in the, in the crowd might remember for me, but if she was actually suspended or fired, but for sharing with her students the QR code for the Brooklyn Public Library's program to um, allow students to access any of the books that have been banned around the country uh, for free. And she merely shared the QR code to give people this access, to give her students this access and, and was retaliated against for it. So, you know, the digital access is also, also um, on the line here, most definitely. Thank you, Summer, for jumping in. Um, just to be mindful about time, I do want to open it up to questions from the audience, but I have one last burning question to everyone, all our authors. What are your favorite band books? <laughs> Marcus, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, something Justin was saying earlier, I mean, so many, right? All of them, basically. <laughs> um, right now, one, I mean, one that I just think is such a massively important book, Mouse, M-A-U-S, Mouse, mm -hmm. Mouse. Um, that to me is also really, really frightening that that book would be challenged. I mean, it's literally his father's history. Um, so huge, huge place in my heart for Mouse. All of them, though. I mean, so many. It, you know, yeah, that's where you go to find what the good books are to read. <laughs> I, I, I would jump in with Fun Home because I teach Fun Home every year. This is uh, Alison Bechdel's graphic memoir uh, about her relationship with her closeted father. And um, it's difficult, it's complex, it's, it's, it's got depth to it. And it, you know, gets at 40 questions about identity and, and, you know, how we, you know, queerness in the world. And, um, uh, you know, I don't want, I, I just don't want conversations to be flattened, you know, like it, it, they've got to be, robust. And that means we have to have books that challenge us um, in every possible way. So um, yeah, Fun Home is a good example of that for me. Uh, I'm kind of like Marcus. It's, it's sort of like the <laughs> 1,500 banned books. There, <laughs> That is where the good books are. Um, but I'll just shout out a few. Um, Toni Morrison, all of her work was incredibly influential on me. I can't even believe we're discussing the, the banning um, her books. Likewise, Margaret Atwood gave us the framework to kind of recognize what's happening with Christian nationalism, uh, sounded the alarm a long time ago. Uh, Jason Reynolds uh, is just a beautiful soul who has uh, created books and readers um, throughout uh, the entire country of people who I think um, just feel joy about books because he brought them to him to them. Um, I am right now reading All Boys Aren't Blue, which is right up there with gender queer. Um, and I've been thinking about it a lot of just about how important books are that investigate masculinity because I think the when we uh, look at what are the forces. The patriarchy is one of the forces that uh, you can see uh, rippling through all this Mishadas. Um, and the list could go on, but those are a few. Oh, I just wanted to also shout out to, um, I'm really sad too that Dr. Uh, Jewel Parker Rhodes couldn't be here tonight. Uh, her book, Ghost Boys, is. And it's and it's written for a middle grade audience too. You know, somebody was talking about this, the legacy of of police brutality and murder and a black youth, and and she does that in this timeless way. And then it's also for middle school kids. It's it's a stunning book. So shout out to Ghost Boys. 
Thank you, Marcus. Yeah, I, I agree. And for me, it's um, like Dashka said, Toni Morrison. I get such a visceral reaction every time I read Beloved is once again being banned somewhere. Um, Summer, what about you? Hi, I'm afraid I have to say Beloved too. I think reading that mm -hmm. uh, senior year of high school was uh, an absolutely pivotal moment for me and completely blew my mind. And I always say that it's the book that made me an English major. And there's probably a direct line from reading it then to working at PEN America today. So that that is the top of my list. Wow, mm. that's, yeah, that <laughs> makes sense. And now I'm uh, scanning the chat for questions. Uh, if anybody has, there are some great quotes here and um, some links the pen america links and people are now sharing their favorite pen books which is really fun to see um so thank you all that for that i don't see a question maybe perhaps i'm missing it but if there is no question then i will just sneak in one more question mm -hmm. <laughs> i so this is a scenario let's say there is a young author whose book just came out and it's being challenged ban for one reason or another in multiple states and they're disheartened what would you all say to this author in terms of yeah courage and whatnot i'll, go, I'll jump in i think i would just say kind of something riffing off of what summer said which is i think i would just invite that person I'm gonna get choked up saying this, but to remember when you read something that impacted you and what the impact was. And the, the route between whoever wrote that book getting to you, mm -hmm. um, to just be that for somebody else, I guess is what I would say. That's powerful. Yeah, thank you. Justin, go ahead. I mean, just to think about the legacy of this, right? I mean, we're uh, the 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 work that we're talking about is, I mean, Toni Morrison is without a doubt one of the greatest writers who's ever set foot on the planet. Like, I mean, you know, you are in an august company. <laughs> um, and, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, and, you know, obviously the sort of adversity you shouldn't have to deal with, um, but, um, you know, sometimes great work uh, it triggers really difficult uh, reactions, and there is a legacy of this, and there are people who have gone through this, uh, and there is support for you. Um, I, one, one of the things that one of the th things I sort of love about my comics community is there's a DIY aspect to it, right? Um, it's uh, self publication, uh, self publishing, and sort of uh, punk rock zines, wow. and like mini comics are a huge uh, backbone to to the comics world. Um, uh, and that community has always dealt with the sort of like, oh, you don't like my work? Well, screw you. Like, I'm going to go and make it myself for my people, and I don't care, you know? So um, I, I think having a bit of that um, uh, uh, punk rock attitude, I, I think we can all learn a bit from. <laughs> <laughs> and Dashka, do you have any words uh of wisdom? <laughs> Uh, one is that, you know, that authors are, we are part of this incredible community of writers and readers, and uh, that we have um, been fighting this fight for a long time. I, I also want to uh, bring up um, another book, which is my father's book, my father, the sociologist Philip Slater, uh, wrote a book called The Chrysalis Effect, in which he predicted a lot of what we're seeing. And it's something that I turn to a lot for comfort. Um, he basically posited that we are in the midst of uh, a paradigm shift from uh, what he called controller culture, which is authoritarian, uh, divided into rigid categories, uh, to an integrative culture that um, is uh, flattened hierarchies, connected, um, a sort of pan everything, uh, fluid and uh, feminist and queer and all the things that we, I think everyone here delights in and that this change is hard and we are seeing massive resistance from the old paradigm, but that it is it is too late to, to turn back the clock. And so um, 
for anyone feeling discouraged, which is probably all of us, um, that is <laughs> that is something that I think about a lot. Is is that uh, we are part of a, a global paradigm shift, and uh, I hope that we we get to you know see in our lifetimes the end of it. But it is going to keep moving regardless. Thank you, Dashka, and thank you all. Um, I, it's going to be really hard for me to bring this to a closure because I could just sit here for another hour, if not two, if not seven, uh, with all of you and continue our discussions. There's so much more to talk about. Um, what I'm taking away from this conversation is, as Marcus said, we are terrified, we're wary. At the same time, we are determined. And Justin brought in the optimism and the inspiration too. We are determined. Um, we are here for books, authors, readers, um, librarians, and students, and teachers, um, for stories for everyone. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, next time, hopefully, we'll do this in person. Wouldn't that be lovely? And please keep on reading Ben books. 